to Math and Modeling Methods. This is uh, lecture number 25, our last lecture for the semester. And uh, today we're going to have a brief discussion on more than maybe 45 minutes or so or less. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the test. Okay? And uh, we're going to make some decisions about that. And uh, we're going to ask you some questions. Uh, remember also that the uh, instructor evaluations are are uh, available on Canvas. I think the response rate right now is zero percent. So make sure you complete them. Yeah, we get a lot of a lot of emails uh, asking us to tell the students to make sure you complete. Um, so, all right. So what we're going to cover today is um, yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. So, I'll I just want to turn it. You'll be in first uh, camera there. Um, collecting homework number three today also. Um, what we'll talk about today is just to extend our discussion on separation of variables and superposition to problems in spherical coordinate systems, okay? We talked about uh, these techniques apply to problems in Cartesian coordinates. We talked about these techniques apply to problems in cylindrical coordinates. And uh, when we go to spherical coordinates, which obviously have a gamut of applications in engineering and sciences, because a lot of things in science happens spherically, gravity, electromagnetic waves, everything propagates spherically uh, from a source point or, or, or to a target point, um, sound, so on and so forth. Um, and so many equations in engineering and science that are governed by, um, or maybe a phenomena are governed by equations which must be expressed in spherical coordinate systems. And in, in the general case scenario, we have uh, full dependency with respect to the radial direction, with respect to the equatorial angle, and with respect to the azimuthal angle. Okay, we'll write the coordinate system. And then you will see that simple equations, such as the diffusion equation, turn out to be a nightmare, okay, just because the transformation of the coordinates. Remember that the Laplace operator looks a lot different uh, when expressed in, in spherical coordinates than what it does in, in Cartesian coordinates. And therefore, uh, there's a need to actually uh, go through some substitutions and some some uh, uh, techniques to be able to apply separation of variables and uh, and the likes. All right, so let's talk about this separation of variables. We call them S O V in spherical. So let me uh, let me go to a simple case first. I'm gonna go to the end of my presentation. Okay, consider the diffusion equation. That's what we're looking at. Diffusion equation. Um, in a problem with R and T dependency. That means axisymmetric with respect to phi and theta with respect to the equatorial and the azimuthal angle in spherical coordinates. All right, so we'll look into this. This is the same equation that we've been dealing with, which is, in this case, we the dependent variable is t, is the temperature, but that equation actually governs many other uh, phenomena, not just 
conduction or heat diffusion. It could, could be applied to mass diffusion. It could be applied uh, to the pressure diffusion and surface waves. In many fields, this equation, same equation appears. And remember, we have plus boundary conditions and initial conditions. Okay? So when we express this operator, the Laplace operator, and spherical coordinates, it looks like this. Okay, this is the arc coordinate of the um, Laplace operator. Um, we're not going to look at the rest of the coordinates, we'll do that later. 1 over alpha dt dt or t. Okay? So this basically looks like the second t dr squared plus 2 over r dt dr is equal to 1 over alpha dt dt. Okay, so there's a very neat trick when we have these type of long problems where the dependent variable only depends on R. This applies to diffusion problems, but it can also be applied to wave problems. But the point is that, okay, most problems in spherical coordinates are going to be seen to just depend on the radial coordinate, not on the other two angles. So this, this trick actually is very useful. We let you, we do a change of variable. Very simple, and make u equals r times t. t being the temperature, the original dependent variable, we're going to change it to u. And notice that the u dr now becomes r dt dr plus t. And therefore, the second derivative of u with respect to r squared becomes r second derivative of t with respect to r squared plus dt dr plus dt dr. We have two of those. So, and we'll go back to the governing equation back to governing equation, what we end up with is that when we plug this in here, the second derivative of t with respect to uh, r squared and so on would just simply be, let me, let me rewrite the whole thing. Plus 2r dt dr t is equal to 1 over alpha equal to one over alpha and the TDR is one over R UDT. This one and this one cancel out and therefore the equation now looks like this. So the equation for you now looks like, so equation for u of r and t 
looks like a Cartesian <coughs> equation function of with respect to x and t. It's a, as if we were solving an equation of d squared t dx squared is equal to the transient term 1 over alpha dt dt. Okay? So we basically need to transform ECs and IC boundary conditions such that um, U of R and T is equal to R T. Whether it's on the boundary at any value of R or whether it's on the interior or whether it is, I'm sorry, on the boundary or whether it is at time equal zero. We can use this transformation. So basically we've transformed a problem in spherical coordinates where this is z, this is y, and this is x. This is a radial coordinate a problem for, we've transformed it into a problem for u of r and t. And we solve the problem for u with the techniques that we already know. And then once we find it, we can say that T is U over R. So solve and let T of R and T be equal to 1 over R times U of R and T. And that's it. So not much to this one. This one's pretty straightforward. Symmetry. And when I say axis symmetry and, and spherical coordinates, we're talking about symmetry with respect to the equatorial angle and symmetry with respect to the azimuthal angle. Okay? So, what is this? What if there were not axis symmetry? So now t is a function of r. Um, we express it theta, phi, and t. And the coordinate system looks like this. Let me write a circle first. Let's say uh, we pick a uh, differential of surface here on the surface of the sphere. We point to that location. That's R. This angle right here with respect to the z-axis is called the, uh, the azimuthal angle, theta. And the projection of these onto the plane x-axis is called the equatorial angle. Okay, we've already gone through all the coordinate transformations at the beginning of the semester. We talked about how these vector operators look like, the metrics, the scale factors, everything. So now we're looking at the same, the heat diffusion equation. A 
it's actually the same because the same equation applies, just that now it is expressed a little differently. Operator, the radial portion of the operator. Looks like that. The azimuthal portion of the operator looks like 1 over r squared sine square of theta d d theta sine theta theta, and the equatorial portion looks like 1 over r squared sine squared of theta times the second derivative of t with respect to phi squared, and this is equal to 1 over alpha dt dt. Let's just write the dependency. Now let's, uh, let's expand this first term, which it's not much to it, but it's just uh, uh, the second t, the r squared, plus 2 over r, we already did this actually, the t, the r, and keep writing the whole thing again. Plus 1 over r squared sine square of theta. is equal to 1 over alpha dt dt. And so on. All right. So when the equation looks like this, this is the general form of the equation. Again, regardless of what boundary conditions we have, first, second, or third kind, whether this is a full sphere or solid sphere or a hollow sphere, there's an internal diameter or radius, I'm sorry, whether this is a wedge of a sphere, a hemisphere, a quarter of a sphere, so there are some limits into the asymmetrical or equatorial angles, the equation will look like that. And as it is, that equation cannot be separated, okay? Even if we let t be equal to a function of r, a function of theta, a function of phi, a function of time, will not be able to separate. And somebody <coughs> proposes change of variables. Define a new variable. And this variable is mu. And we're going to let mu be equal to the cosine of theta. So we're going to replace theta by mu. And in doing so, we hope that these signs in there in that equation will disappear. So. Basically, d mu is equal to minus the sine of theta d theta, and therefore, sine square of theta, which is equal to 1 minus the cosine square of theta, is equal to 1 minus mu square. Notice that dt theta is equal to dt, d mu, d mu, d theta, the chain rule, which is equal to minus sine theta, uh, dt, d mu. So when we use this, chain, this new variable in the governing equation, governing equation being that one up there, plugging into governing equation, we get the second derivative of t with respect to r squared plus 2 over r dt dr plus 1 over r squared d d mu 
1 minus mu square dt d mu plus 1 over r square 1 minus mu square d second t d p square is equal to 1 over alpha <coughs> dt dt. And this is the new equation which is pretty much this, the same, but it doesn't have the sign of theta anyway. And it's one that could actually be separated. <coughs> a little tricky to do, but it can be separated. All right. So how are we going to do that? As always, we do separation of variables. Let T of R uh, mu P and T be equal to R of R M of mu phi of phi and tau of T. And hopefully when we put plug that in there, things will start disappearing and separating. R's on one side, mu's on the other or theta, or no, sorry, p's on the other, and so on. So this would look like r double prime of r divided by r of r plus 2 over r, r prime of r divided by r of r plus 1 over m of mu, 1 over r squared d d mu, 1 minus mu squared, m prime of mu, plus 1 over r squared, 1 minus mu squared, phi double prime of phi, divided by phi of phi, is equal to 1 over alpha, tau prime of t, divided by tau of t. And as we can see, everything on the left hand side is a function of r, mu, and phi. Everything on the right hand side is a function of t. So we've effectively separated. And the only way that this equality can hold is <coughs> this is equal to a constant. And we're going to make that constant negative because the same argument we always employ. It has to be negative so that we can form eigenvalue problems in all directions. And it has to be negative so that the solution in time is decaying. It's asymptotic. In time, the equation looks like tau prime of t plus alpha lambda squared tau of t is equal to zero, which essentially will produce the same form as always, e to the minus alpha lambda squared t. Same one we get when the problem is Cartesian, the same one we get when the problem is cylindrical, Dependency on time is always the same because we are not transforming the time domain. We're not transforming the time direction. Unlike what we do in Fourier transforms or Laplace transforms, I don't know if you ever remember that or you remember that from uh, undergrad school. The way they operate is basically a variable transformation in time and settlement space. So in the Fourier transform, we transform the time to a frequency domain, and in the Laplace transform, we transform the time to another variable called s, which has a meaning in some stretching and some shrinking of that dimension. So uh, solutions in time look a little different in the transform space, but when you bring it back, you always get this exponential decay, at least in the diffusion equation. All right. So let's uh, let's try to. The next thing, 
is to get the rest of the equation that is equal to minus lambda squared. We've already taken care of this one. And so take this denominator here and multiply everything by that denominator so that we can isolate phi. Right? So now we have r squared 1 minus mu squared. That multiplies. And we're going to make this r double prime of r, r of r, plus 2 over r, r prime of r, r of r, plus 1 over m of mu, 1 over r squared, d, d mu, 1 minus mu squared, and prime of mu. equal to minus phi double prime of phi divided by phi of phi and now separate it and we make this equal to a constant of separation which we can call whatever we want mu squared we make it positive so that we can form an eigenvalue problem in the phi direction okay so the resulting equation looks like an eigenvalue problem but I am purposely making it m to denote that this is an integer because in the equatorial direction, we only allow for these to be a full circle. If we want half a circle, we cut the azimuthal direction and half, for example, for a hemisphere. So the equation in phi looks like phi double prime of phi plus m squared phi of phi is equal to zero plus homogeneous boundary conditions. In reality, we don't allow homogeneous boundary conditions in this case because there's no boundaries. So, plus periodicity in phi. Okay, the equatorial angle, phi, goes from 0 to 2 pi. What happens at any angle phi is the same as what happens at any angle phi plus 2 pi. And that basically results in the eigenvalues m being integers. So phi of phi is equal to b cosine of m plus c sine of m. such that m goes from 0, 1, all the way to infinity, integers, from periodicity. All right. So let's look at what's left of the equation. This whole thing is equal to m squared. We've already taken care of phi. So let's multiply and divide so that we can separate the r's from the mu's. So we'll multiply everything by r squared and divide by 1 minus mu squared. Send the mu's to the right hand side and we'll end up with r squared, r double prime of r over r of r plus 2 over r, r prime of r, r of r. Okay, for some reason, I missed something up here. Lambda squared. Plus lambda squared. Goes there. the square. Okay? So here we have that lambda square and we're going to send everything that depends on mu to the right hand side. D, D mu. 1 minus mu square and prime of mu plus m square 
one minus mu squared. Right? So now we have an equation that is perfectly separated, r on one side, mu on the other side. So we can make this equal to a separation variable or separation constant. The only way this can be equal to each other is if they're both equal to a constant. And we're going to purposely call this constant n times n plus 1. Okay? Instead of calling it n square, or instead of calling it mu square or nu square, we're purposely going to call it n times n plus 1. You're going to see why in a minute. Okay? It's just basically a positive constant. We want to form an eigenvalue problem here. We make this a, a positive constant. So, if that's the case, then the equation in mu will look like d d mu. One minus mu squared and prime of mu plus n n plus one minus m squared divided by one minus mu squared times m of mu is equal to zero. And that is an equation that we've seen before, believe it or not. We haven't seen it with a mu, we've seen it with an x, but it looks identical. I don't know if you remember when we're looking at variable coefficient or near differential equations, we looked at a special case of an equation that looked like this, and it had an n times n plus 1 here, that's why we use that as a separation constant here, because this is what's called the associated of Jandris. So Legendre was the guy who proposed this particular change of variable from phi, oh, sorry, from theta to mu. So and he noticed that in the mu direction, you end up with this equation. And he actually de derived and developed the formulation to solve that particular variable coefficient, second order linear ordinary differential equation using um, series expansions. And at the end, the solution comes out to be m of mu is equal to d, constant of integration, q and m of mu. And if you remember the name of these p's and q's, these are just the Lagrange functions of first and second order, P is the first order, Q is the second order, uh, degree N, order M, and these are the polynomials because N happens to be a constant, okay, so the, the series actually truncates at a polynomial. And these are already, these are functions that are predefined, you go to any mathematical spreadsheet, you ask MathCat to evaluate the Legendre polynomial of the first kind of degree N, order M, at any value mu, and it will give it to you as if it were a sine or a cosine. It's just an intrinsic function like any other one, like the Bessel function, for example. You don't have to evaluate the infinite series. It will give it to you directly. So these P and M is the associated Legendre polynomial of the first kind of n and order m. And q and m is the same. The same thing. Associated the genre polynomial of the second kind of degree n and order. These are just polynomials of different orders and different degrees, which are very well documented. All right? So we solve the problem in the m direction. And what we're left with is the problem in the r direction. The problem in the r direction looks like r squared, r double prime of r, plus 2r, r prime of r, plus 
lambda square r square minus n times n plus 1, r of r is equal to 0, plus some boundary conditions, plus homogeneous boundary conditions in r. Whether this is a solid sphere or a hollow sphere, you have internal radius and, and outer radius, or just outer radius, you apply these boundary conditions and they have to be homogeneous, whether there's first kind, second kind, or third kind. All right, now what does that equation look like? We have r squared, r, and r squared. That's the Bessel equation, right? It's sort of like the Bessel equation. The only difference here, well, this, this is usually just n on the Bessel equation, but the Bessel equation doesn't have these two here, and that too makes a huge difference. That two, instead of being a one, made the solution of these not directly be the Bessel functions. It's, they're functions of the Bessel functions, but not directly them. This is called the spherical Bessel equation of order n. Okay, and it's called spherical because it arises when solving problems in spherical coordinates. That too only shows up when we do things in spherical coordinates because we have the r square when we differentiate r square and we get 2r. Okay, and cylindrical coordinates we get r, not 2r. So we get the regular Bessel equation. So we're, we know what the solution of the regular Bessel equation is. It's j's and y's. Okay, the spherical Bessel equation needs a little transformation. We let r of r be equal to r to the minus one half, so one over the square root of r times <coughs> r of r. Okay, it's just a basic transformation that we need to do, and then this equation turns into r squared, this new r double prime, and this now becomes just r plus the square, r square, and this number here now becomes n plus a half square r of r. You can try it. Okay. I'll just replace r by r with minus one half, <coughs> and you will see that that comes about. And this is the regular Bessel equation. This is just the Bessel equation of order n plus a half, which has solutions f, constant of integration, times j to the n plus a half, or order n plus a half, lambda r, plus g times y, that's a Bessel function of the second kind of order n plus a half, lambda r. And all we need to do is bring it back, bring this super r back to r by multiplying it by square root of r. Right? So basically, Therefore, r of r is simply f times j n plus a half of lambda r divided by the square root of r plus g y of n plus a half of lambda r divided by square root of r. So it's just the Bessel functions, which we can, again, using MathCat, MATLAB, Mathematica, even Excel can evaluate Bessel functions. Of order n plus a half, well, I think Excel only can only evaluate the Bessel functions over zero. Um, but you can program it to do the rest. Um, it's just divided by square root of r. Well, somebody wanted to 
make this a new function. Just j divided by the square root of r, because they show up all the time in astrophysics, for example, because you're solving gravitational fields, which happens spherically. Then somebody decided to, in optics as well, to call this lowercase j is the square root of pi over 2r times j plus a half of lambda r. And the lowercase y n of lambda r is square root of pi over 2r. So you see the square root of r on the denominator, just basically offsetting the Bessel function. And the order is now just called simply n instead of n plus a half. Okay, and these are called the spherical vessel functions. Obviously, of the first kind, second kind, of order n. So the solution r simply becomes some constant f, which is no longer f, because we multiply times pi over square root of pi over 2, so it's f times square root of pi over 2, times the lowercase j n lambda r plus g times, so we're going to call this f1 g1, y n of lambda r. So this is the actual solution to these equation in the r direction. So now we have the three eigenfunctions. We have sines and cosines in the phi direction. We have um, the gender polynomials in the mu direction. And then we have um, spherical vessel functions in the r direction. And then we put them all together into a t of r mu phi and t is equal to three summations. N, M, and so on, L, whatever we're going to call it, R of R, the three eigenfunctions, M of mu, phi of phi, and tau of tau. And we have all these constants of integration to determine. Apply non-homogeneous initial condition to determine constants of integration through orthogonality. All right. So there you have it. 45 minutes is a prompt. This is the only review that the, the only thing that we're going to talk about spherical coordinate systems, as you can see, gets pretty hairy. Um, you add dependencies, you add boundary conditions, you add even steady problems, then now you have to deal with non homogeneities uh, and the boundary conditions, superposition, and so on. Uh, you can do separation of variables, you can also do variation of parameters and other techniques, Green's functions in spherical coordinates. And uh, we can spend, well, I won't be sure anybody would want to do that, but we can spend full semesters just talking about how equations behave in spherical coordinates and looking at the possibility of solutions and so on. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's it. That's uh, what we wanted to cover, what I wanted to cover in this math class. Um, I know it uh, at some points during the during the semester it got to be um, a little bit confusing, but this is math, right? And we're engineers. You know, what distinguishes us, I think, in my opinion, is the ability to understand these things, not necessarily to directly apply them, but the ability to to use this information, to use these tools, to be able to solve problems. That's what we train for. I just to uh, to use software. Because under the hood of all the software that we use is all the stuff. So if we're just software users, we're not engineers. We need to understand and 
to be able to interpret the, the solutions. So, um, are there any questions at this point? I wanted to uh, just end here and cut the video and then talk about the exam outside of the video um, so that we can make some decisions. All right. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me stop this and we'll talk about the exam.